Warning, this video contains graphic descriptions of a crime scene and adult dialogue that some viewers may find disturbing. It also contains fake blood and gore. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Um, my name's Chloe and today I thought I'd sit down and do another murder mystery case. Um, today I thought we'd talk about the Velisca Axe murders. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of this uh, case as well. But today I thought I'd sit down and talk in depth about that case. And also while I'm talking about the case, I thought I'd sit down and do a Christmassy SFX makeup look too, just to keep myself busy. Um, so I really, really hope you enjoy the video guys. And other than that, let's just get into it. So for today's case guys, we're going to go to the small city of Villisca in Montgomery County, Iowa, United States. So the population in 2010 of Villisca was roughly about 1,252 people and then by 2018 the population had actually dropped to roughly about 1,153 people. Villisca even though being a small city it did have quite the military history under its belt so it was responsible for the construction of Iowa's only publicly funded and longest running armory and also into the 1916 expedition of Me the Mexican World War One, World War Two, and also the Vietnam and Korean War. So we're just going to jump straight into um, the family in question in this case, which is the Moore family. So Josiah Moore was a well-known businessman in the small city of Villisca, and he was actually married to a lady named Sarah Moore. And they also had four kids together, Herman aged 11, Catherine aged 10, Paul aged five and Boyd aged seven. So it was said that the Moore family were actually quite well known in the small city of Villisca. Um, obviously with Josiah being a big businessman, everyone sort of knew the family. They were also very well liked in the community from what I could gather. So it doesn't make sense why anyone would want to hurt this family. So in 1903, the Moore family actually ends up purchasing their own little home in Villisca. Now from what I could see of the pictures, it was a normal enough home um, do you know, it was a three bedroom, one bath, so it was, it wasn't a small house, you know, that's a decent sized house. So the house consists of um, an open plan kitchen as you walk into the house. So when you open the front door, that's what you see is the kitchen. And um, so say if you're standing up at the cooker in the kitchen and looking back into the room, there's four doors on your right as you're looking back into the room. So door number one is the front door, the entry door. The door number two is actually the bathroom in the house. So then door number three is um, a staircase and the staircase actually leads up into the master bedroom where Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Moore slept. Um, and then across the room from the master bedroom also was a third bedroom. So that was the room that the kids slept in upstairs. So door number four then was actually the sitting room slash living room area. Um, so when you walked through that door, to the right of that was another door. And through that door was actually the downstairs uh, bedroom. So it was the the first bedroom. And it was the only bedroom downstairs. So the Moore family, as I said, were a well-liked family. Do you know, nothing seemed out of the ordinary in the city of Villisca. Or that's what it seemed. So on Sunday evening, the 9th of June, 1912, the Moore family actually end up going to a Children's Day service at the Presbyterian Church. So the Children's Day service was an actual end of year Sunday school program. So Sarah Moore was actually co-director of this Sunday school program. Um, so her kids ended up being involved quite a bit and would perform quite a bit in, in the program. So they would do um, like performances, they would do readings and stuff like that with other members. So there was also two neighbor girls, um, Lena Stillinger, 12 years old, and Ina Stillinger, eight years old. They actually end up joining the Moore family to the Children's Day service that Sunday evening. Now, the Stillinger girls were actually quite close to the Moore family kids. So it's actually believed that Catherine Moore invited Lena and Ina Stillinger over for a sleepover that night. So the Stillinger girls asked their parents could they spend the night at the Moore family home and also asked could they go to the Children's Day service that Sunday evening with them. Their parents agreed, so that's exactly what the girls did. They tagged along with the Moore family and they went to the Children's Day service together. So it's believed that the Children's Day service actually ended roughly around 9.30 that night after everyone sort of sat down, you know, had the chats, mingled for a little bit, and then everyone left and went home. So it's roughly around uh, this time, 9.30 p.m., that 
the more family and the Stillinger neighbour girls actually end up leaving and they end up walking roughly about three blocks back home to the Moore family home. And sadly, this would be the last time that Annie even was seen alive again. So it was said that everyone had some milk and cookies before everyone headed to bed that night. So sometime after midnight that night to the early morning of June 10th, 1912, it was actually said that the murder slash murderers picked up Josiah's axe from the back garden and proceeded to enter the home. And this is sadly where all eight victims inside the Moore family home were brutally murdered in their beds. So roughly around 7.30am that morning, uh, June 10th, 1912, the next door neighbour, Mary Peckham, actually ends up getting quite concerned over the Moore family. She said that it was unusually quiet for that time of morning. She said that usually um, Josiah would be out like working on the farm or you'd be you'd see the kids running around you know playing in the front garden the back garden there'd be some sort of life around that time of morning but there was nothing she said that it was just eerily quiet so obviously you know with small kids in the house it's usually chaos like screaming shouting playing running there's usually so much noise going on but there was as she said there was absolutely nothing it was so eerily quiet so she did become concerned. So Mary said that she actually went to the front door and she knocked on the door and there was no answer. So then she decided to go around the back of the house and that's when she noticed that the farm animals were still all locked up in their houses. So she knocked on the back door also, again, there was no answer. So Mary grew more and more concerned. So that's when Mary decides to ring Josiah's brother Ross now Ross was the local druggist, so that's like a pharmacist or a retailer of medical drugs. So roughly around 8am is when Ross actually arrives at the Moore family home. Now Ross um, knew that everyone was supposed to be there. He knew that they weren't scheduled to be anywhere else. He knew that the family should have been at the home, which was strange. So him and the neighbour Mary start to look around for a spare key into the home. And Ross actually comes across the spare key and lets himself into the home. So Ross uh, walked into the home and he said that he noticed it was still really quiet. There was no signs of anybody in there. and um, So he just decided to walk around the home and investigate. So Ross actually walks into the sitting room slash living room area. And remember earlier on in the video I said, as you walk into the living room area, to the right of that was the downstairs bedroom. So Ross walks into the downstairs bedroom and that's where he notices what seems to be two figures wrapped in a white sheet. And that's where he also noticed that there was uh, blood on the bed frame of the bed. So sadly, the two figures wrapped in the white sheet actually turned out to be um, Ina and Lena Stillinger, the two neighbour girls that spent a night in the Moore house. So understandably, after Ross seeing um, the two figures wrapped in the white sheet, he freaks out and he runs out of the house. Now, I have to say, I'd do the same thing. I would be like, what the shit is going on? And then I'd probably pass out, to be honest. So when Ross comes out of the family home, he ends up bringing Josiah's business and asks to speak to an employee named Ed Selly. So Ross told Ed to fetch Marshal Henry Hank Horton because, quote, something terrible had happened. So Marshal Henry Hank Horton actually ends up arriving at the family home roughly around 8.30 a.m. that morning. And he was met by Josiah's brother Ross and I'm assuming the neighbour was still there, Mary Peckham. Not much was said, I'm not sure if she was still there but I'm just going to assume that she was. So Hank ends up searching the family home and that's when he realises just how gruesome and brutal the scene was. So Hank actually came out and told Ross, um, Josiah's brother, quote, that he found someone murdered in every bed. He also went on to say that he found what he thought to be the partially clean murder weapon, an axe leaning up against the wall of the first bedroom where the Stillinger neighbour girls were found. Dr. J. Clark Cooper was the first doctor on scene. He said he walked into the bedroom where Ina and Lena Stillinger were found and when he walked into the room he said that he saw um, an arm covered in blood sticking out from underneath the cover in the room. He said that the faces of every victim inside the home was so unrecognisable because of how badly beaten their faces had been. It's believed that each victim was beaten between 20 and 30 times with the blunt end of the axe. However the sticker was, it wasn't enough that they murdered eight innocent people, but they had to leave some bizarre touches to the scene. It is believed that whoever committed these murders covered all eight victims' heads with a sheet. They also had searched the dressers for items of clothing to cover every mirror in the house, 
and also the glass on the entry doors into the house. They also left a four pound slab of bacon left leaning up against the wall beside what was believed to be the murder weapon, the axe. And on the kitchen table, there was a plate of uneaten food and right next to it was a big bowl of bloody water. So investigators noticed that in the master bedroom upstairs where Mr. and Mrs. Moore slept and also the room across from the master bedroom where the kids slept, there was all gouge marks in the ceiling and on the wall. And investigators believed that this was from the upswing of the axe. So whoever committed these murders had left a mark in the wall. And the nightgown of 12 year old Lena Stillinger had been pulled up and she was left exposed. But doctors concluded that there was no sign of sexual assault. And also investigators believe that Lena Stillinger could have actually been awake at the time of the attack. Um, and she might have been the only one to see her murderer alive. Investigators came to this conclusion because there was um, what believed to be a defensive wound on Lena's arm. Um, so it was if she had put her arm up across her face to sort of protect herself. And also she had a blood stain on her knee. There was also another strange thing mentioned that one of Sarah Moore's shoes had blood on the inside of the shoe and underneath the shoe. But it was left on Josiah's side of the bed. An investigator said that there was no sign of forced entry into the house or of like any sort of break in or anything like that. And one of the things that they said also, and it just gave me shivers down my spine, was that the door was actually locked from the inside. So how could anyone have got in unless they had a key or found a spare key into the home? Or maybe someone could have already been in the house at the time of the murders. So now let's take a look at the suspects of the Villisca Axe murder case. So the first suspect that investigators were looking at was a man named Reverend Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly. So investigators were interested in Reverend Kelly because the morning following the murders, roughly around 5.19am, this was before the Moore family or the Stillinger girls were found. Reverend Lynn George Jacqueline Kelly actually ended up leaving Villisca on board the number 5 westbound train. Reverend Kelly then started to inform fellow passengers on the train that there were, quote, eight dead souls back in Villisca, Iowa, butchered in their beds while they slept, end quote. But as I said, this was before the Moore family or the Stillinger girls were found. So it's said that Reverend Kelly actually arrived in Villisca the morning of the 9th of June, 1912, and had attended the Children's Day service that evening, which the Moore kids and the Stillinger girls performed at. He then left Villisca early on Monday morning, June 10th, 1912, the morning of the murders. He then returned two weeks later, and I don't know how he managed it, but he joined an investigation tour of the Moore house, disguised as a detective. That's crazy that he was able to pose as a detective, and no one even questioned it or thought there was anything off about it. Things are really different in the early 1900s. If you tried that today, you'd end up in a prison cell. Reverend Kelly, through the years, had also racked up a bit of a reputation for odd behaviour. He apparently had been convicted of sending obscene material through the mail. He also had put ads in the newspaper looking for a female secretary to work for him, but not just any female secretary, one to work preferably in the nude. It's believed that Reverend Kelly suffered a mental breakdown when he was younger, and he also ended up spending some of his adult years in a mental hospital. Reverend Kelly was the son and the grandson of English ministers, and it's believed in 1904 he actually immigrated to America with his wife. While in America, um, Reverend Kelly preached in churches all over, so in North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, and also Kansas. He'd also been assigned as a traveling minister of several small cities north of Villisca. A grand jury indicated um, Reverend Lynn Kelly for only Lena Stillinger's murder. I don't know why that was, but he was only being tried for her murder. Reverend Lynn Kelly was then questioned and interrogated in the summer of 1917 while in prison awaiting trial. So on August 31st at 7am, Reverend Lynn Kelly actually ends up signing a confession saying that he was behind the murders of the Moore family and the Sillinger girls. He said that God had whispered to him, quote, suffered the children to come on to me, end quote. But not long after this, Reverend Kelly actually ends up recanting his confession at trial. His case then ends up going to the jury on the 26th of September. The jury actually ends up deadlocking 11 to 1 for acquittal. A second jury was then brought in, but once again, Reverend Lynn Kelly was acquitted in November. Due to not enough evidence against him, 
They had no hard evidence against Reverend Lynn Kelly. The only evidence they had was word of mouth. And so everyone that had seen and heard what he said on the train, it was all word of mouth. The only hard evidence that the investigators had was actually Reverend Lynn Kelly's signed confession. But then he later recanted that. So the confession was irrelevant. They had no proper evidence against Reverend Lynn Kelly. So let's take a look at the second suspect that investigators were looking at. A man named Frank F. Jones. Now Frank was a well-respected member of the community and he was also an Iowa State Senator. Frank was also Josiah Moore's previous boss. Now Josiah was said to work for Frank for several years before quitting to start his own business. Josiah set up his own business selling farm implements. When Josiah stopped working for Frank, it was said that he took a lucrative John Deere contract with him. While this doesn't seem like enough of a motive to kill, there was also rumours going around that Josiah Moore was actually having an affair with Frank F. Jones' daughter. Detective Wilkerson of the Barnes Detective Agency in Kansas City actually accused Frank F. Jones of the crime, but nothing more came of it. Now, the third suspect was a man named William Mansfield. Detective Wilkerson believed that Frank F. Jones was the mastermind behind the Moore family murders. Now, Frank F. Jones did have money. He was a big businessman. So Detective Wilkerson believed that Frank paid off William Mansfield to do his dirty work and commit the murders. So William Mansfield was a suspected uh, serial killer and he was believed to be responsible for the murders of his wife, his infant child, his in-laws and also some similar style axe murders that had happened in Kansas just four days before the Villisca murders. Detective Wilkerson actually convinced the grand jury to open up an investigation on William Mansfield in 1916. Eventually an alibi was provided for William Mansfield, eventually leading to his release. Later William Mansfield actually successfully sued Detective Wilkerson and was awarded $2,225 and that in today's money is roughly about $30,000. That was a lot of money to get back then. A lot of money to get now for a serial killer. So let's get on to the fourth suspect, a man named Henry Lee Moore. Now, he was no relation whatsoever to the Moore family. In May 1913, a federal investigator actually believed that he had solved the Villisca axe murders along with 22 similar style axe murders across the country. And he believed that the man behind these axe murders was a man named Henry Lee Moore. Henry Lee Moore had actually just been convicted of the murder of his mother and his grandmother just a few months after the Villisca axe murders. Henry Lee Moore was paroled in 1949 and served 36 years of the life sentence that he was handed down for murdering his mother and his grandmother. It's just absolutely ridiculous that someone would get out on parole after murdering somebody. Not just one person, two people. Despite claims from the federal investigator, Henry Lee Moore was never charged with the Villisca axe murders or any of the other 22 axe murders he was suspected of. Now let's talk about the fifth suspect, a man named Andy Sawyer. Now I couldn't find any pictures of Andy Sawyer, um, but he was someone that the investigators were also looking at. Andy Sawyer was actually reported to the sheriff by his employer for having apparent odd behaviour. It was said that Andy Sawyer was very interested in the Villisca Axe murders. So Andy Sawyer was actually a worker on the Burlington Railroad. It was also said that he slept fully dressed at night while gripping an axe in bed. Andy Sawyer was detained by the sheriff, but he was later released because it was brought to their attention that Andy Sawyer had actually been arrested the night of the Villisca Axe murders. I'm going to pop up on screen what Andy Sawyer was actually arrested for that night. So investigators knew then that Andy Sawyer wasn't the person that they were looking for either. The Villisca Axe murders to this day still remain one of the biggest unsolved murder cases or crime cases of all time. To this day, no one has been convicted of the Villisca Axe murders. Still, the Moore family home is actually still there to this day. It's now considered to be an historical building in the city of Villisca. I'm going to do my eyebrows quickly off camera and then I'll be right back guys, okay? Okay guys, so I'm back. I've uh, done my eyebrows. I've added some uh, green colour underneath my eye and now I'm just adding a little bit of red just along here. As you can see, I've done it on this side. Just going to do it on this side as well. So you can actually go visit the Moore family home. Um, it's open to tours. So you can go every day bar Monday. So every other day you can go visit the home um, from 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. 
So they also do day tours and I believe it's about $10 to get into the home. So they also do overnight tours. So I looked up the price and um, a group of one to six people cost roughly about $428 or $75 per person. And that today, guys, is the brutal Villisca Axe murders of the Moore family and the two neighbors, the Stillinger girls. I didn't really time the makeup side of this very well. I got too invested in the case. So I'm very sorry, but you're just gonna have to bear with me for a second till I um, catch up a bit. Okay guys, I'm caught up now. Um, sorry about that, I just completely lost track. I was just too invested in the in the case that I just wasn't paying attention to the makeup, but I'm all caught up now. I just wanna say rest in peace to the Moore family and also Ina and Nina Stillinger. So I'm going to leave it there for today, guys. I really, really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed me sitting down and talking about the Villisca Axe murder case, and I hope you enjoyed the makeup too. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who supported my last video. It really does mean the world to me, all the, the support. So if you like this video, guys, please remember to like, comment and subscribe down below. Let me know in the comments uh, your thoughts on the case. And if you've actually been to visit the Villisca house, um, I'd be really interested in hearing what you guys thought. So thanks so much for watching, guys, and for all your continued support. I'm going to leave it there and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now, guys.